Let's talk about the crucifixion. Denied in Surah 4, 157, categorically, uh, although it says in Surah 4, 157, for they slay him not, for they killed him not, but they thought it so. Another was given his place. Now I'm going to deal with this in a number of ways. I'm going to look at it, at, at, first of all, by centering in on the confusions that, that we find in the Quran, because there are these confusions that exist, and we need to, we need to point them out. Uh, the first one is this idea that, um, that, that the, all, the Quran only is, is unified in this one idea. It isn't unified. There is a confusion with other verses. Surah 19, Ayah 33 Referring to Jesus Christ himself when he says, Blessed be me on the day I was born, the day I die, and the day I rise again. Now, that seems to contradict Surah 4, 1, Ayah 157. But Muslim exegetes, and I agree with them, and I think there's, there's certainly a validity to this, they would say, no, that is a future reference. So he was born, yes, he was born 2,000 years ago, but the day he will die, they put it into a future tense, when he because they believe in, and, and, and the, certainly the traditions are very clear on this, that Christ will come again, the second coming, and when he comes, he'll live for, for roughly 43 years, he will marry, have some number of children, destroy all the crosses, and draw, destroy the pigs, which seems rather obvious <laughs> as to what his problem is there. But certainly, if that is the case, then Surah 19, Ayah 33, is a Suggesting to that second coming when he will then die and then rise again. And I, I, that's fine. If Muslims want to import that, that's great. If they want to assume that's what's happening there, uh, you can see they, they, they almost are desperate to do so because it does contradict Surah 4, 157. So there's a first confusion. There's a confusion within Scripture itself. Um, there's also a theological confusion here because in Surah 4, 157, it does say that another took his place, another was given his image. That means someone else was on the cross instead of Jesus. That was not Jesus there. Someone else took his place. Uh, who is that someone? Uh, some exegetes believe, that, or some traditions believe later, that maybe this could have been Judas or it could have been Simon. Uh, they are probably borrowing from 2nd and 3rd century Gnostic writings, uh, heretical writings, and sectarian writings, which suggest that maybe Judas was on the cross instead of him. So you can see where that has come from. That's neither here nor there. What my problem is that there is a theological contradiction this year as well. Because in Surah 6, Ayah 164, and also in Surah uh, 53, Ayah 38, it's very clear in the Quran, Surah 6, 164, Surah 53, Ayah 38, that nobody can t pay the price or take on the sin of another. That is a theological uh, imposition that is uh, placed on any, but, uh, any reference to Jesus taking our sin. And you can see why it was incorporated into the Quran, because it wanted to alleviate that problem. It wanted to eradicate any suggestion that Jesus had taken the, play, uh, are the sins of all of mankind by dying on the cross. The difficulty is that they have shot them, you have, Muslims have shot themselves in the foot, but because of saying another person was on the cross instead of Jesus, he's taken the, the price of Jesus. He's taken on the sin of Jesus. He's paying the penalty of Jesus on that cross. And uh, so you don't get out of it, you then therefore contradict your own scriptures. So you've got a contradiction within scripture, a, theolo a scriptural contradiction. Uh, you have a theological contradiction with Surah 6, 164, Surah 53, Ayah 38. And then you have a real moral confusion. And here's the moral contradiction. This is one that bothers me probably more than any other. If someone else took Jesus' place on the cross, if that was not Jesus there, then stop and think what that says about your God. What kind of God do you have? If he allows someone else to take Jesus' place, and he doesn't tell anybody. Now remember, we know that there were some people at the foot of the cross who knew Jesus very well. Mary, the mother of Jesus, knew Jesus intimately. I couldn't say she birthed him. She had known him for 33 years. She should certainly have known who was up on the cross there. Now, why didn't Jesus say anything to her? Why didn't uh, Jesus refer or tell her that he was not on the cross? Or why did the man who was on the cross say something? I mean, put yourself in that man's place. Whether it was Judas or whether it was Simon, don't you think he would have said something? Don't you think he would have said, hold on a minute, you got the wrong man here. It's not me. I, I, please, can't you tell me my voice? Ask me a question. Ask me anything. To try to, I'll try, I know I won't be able to answer it. Proving that I'm not Jesus. Don't you think, though, that Mary would have recognized that that wasn't Jesus on the cross? Just by the timber of his voice? Just by his actions? John was also at the foot of the cross. John was his favorite disciple. John had been with him for three years, day and night. He had known Jesus intimately. And certainly he would have known that that wasn't Jesus on the cross. There's two problems. But here's the biggest problem. The next day, the, uh, I'm sorry, three days later when he rose from the dead, that was on the Sunday. He died on the Friday. He rose on the Sunday. When he went into the upper room where the disciples were, they were cowering, they were scared. They, were, they did not want to go outside. He come, comes through the wall, appears to them right there in front of them. There he is. There's Jesus. Now, 
Nowhere in any of the discourse that happened in the upper room there, nowhere in any discourse that happened in that room when he appeared to them, does Jesus ever say that it wasn't he on the cross. In fact, look what he does to Thomas, who doubts him. He says, look at my hands. Look at the holes in my hands. Look at my feet. Look at the holes in my feet and know that it is me. Why in the world would Jesus say that? Why would he show the imprints of the nails in his wrists and also on his feet if it hadn't been him on the cross? It shows a duplicity. It shows a deceitfulness of Jesus. But here is the greatest problem. Stop and think what you're saying, Muslims. If Jesus had not been on the cross, if that was someone else who took his place, according to what Surah 4, 157 is, then what you're telling me is that God not only did not inform his mother, not even known for he did not inform his disciples, but every one of the disciples and all of the Christians went out died, basically they killed themselves, because we know every one of the apostles was killed except for John. They went knowing that that was Jesus on the cross, and Jesus forgot to tell them. More than that, God forgot to tell them. And then for 600 years, nobody told the Christians that that was not God, except for a few sectarian pieces of literature that we're now pulling up from the 2nd and 3rd century, much, much later. Even those are, were always disputed by the early church. What you're saying is God basically deceived all of Christianity for 600 years and then suddenly after in the 7th century suddenly he said oh dear maybe I better get, get this correct let me just go tell this illiterate Arab man and that's who he was he was illiterate he was an Arab he was not very important he was not even specified there's no prophecy of his coming nobody knows about who this Muhammad is except for he himself let me just tell this one man and get the story correct and then he can tell the rest of the world it took God seven, 600 years to the 7th century to finally make up his mind on that what kind of God is that? Stop and think of the moral dilemma you're in. Because what you're telling me is you have a God that's deceitful. You have a God that is for 600 years told nobody about who that person was on the cross. Ah, oh, dear, I'm not, that's the kind of God I don't want to follow. So what is the story? See, here's the problem also for the Muslims. You've got a moral dilemma. You've got a scriptural contradiction. You've also got a, a theological contradiction. But let's then go back and ask one more, more simple question. Who are you going to believe? That happened 2,000 years ago. Are you going to believe someone that actually wrote this down, an illiterate Arab merchant who wrote it down 600 years after the fact, or are you going to go back to the eyewitnesses themselves? See, this is what we have to ask. If you don't believe that Christ was on the cross, then you need to ask, why is it that you're going to believe someone who wrote it, who got this, who believed he got this in a cave, originally in a cave, but then started receiving these revelations over a period of 22 years, from angels, from other pieces, but nobody outside of himself corroborating that evidence. Or are you going to go back to the eyewitnesses? See, whenever something happens, whenever there's an accident, whenever there is a crime, what do police do? One of the first things they do is they put up a sign. What do they do? They put on the sign the date, the place, and the time of when that event happened. And then they put a phone number and they say, Could, if anybody had seen this, please phone this number. What are they looking for? Are they looking for second, third, or fourth witnesses? No, they're looking for eyewitnesses. They want eyewitness event because they want to know who was actually there on the scene. They want to hear from them. They want to know exactly what happened because you know that the eyewitness will always have the, be the best witness. And that's exactly what we need to do with the crucifixion of Jesus Christ. The crucifixion is an historical fact. If it is an historical fact, then we need to go back to the eyewitnesses that were there. We need to go back to John, who was at the foot of the cross. We need to go back to the disciples who were in the upper room when Jesus appeared to them. And then, for about 50 days afterwards, continued to appear for them so 500 people saw Jesus after he was resurrected. We need to go back to those people. We need to go back to their accounts. We need to go back to the uh, testimony of Luke, who is a second generation testimony. But he got it from all the eyewitnesses, and we need to look at their accounts, because they were there. They saw, they even ate with Jesus, and certainly worked with him for the last 50 days of his life on earth. That's much more. But we don't even have to go to that. We can even go to extra biblical material. We can go to the extra-biblical account. Men like Thallus, who is writing in 52 AD, that's just 20 years after Christ's death. Here was a man who was having to dispute a debate with Phlegon, and they were disputing what happened on the day that Christ died, mentioning him by name, and they mentioned that when Christ died, on that day, the sun went dark and the earth shook, supporting exactly what we see in the, in the, in the gospel accounts. Or you can go to men like Tacitus. Now, Tacitus is writing, let's see, his dates are 80 AD. You can go to men like... Um, Josephus, who was writing the end of the first century, the beginning of the second century, he was a Jewish historian who was writing about that event, mentions Jesus died on the cross. Tacitus mentions that it was Christ that was there. Um, Josephus, interestingly, not only mentions that he died, but he also quoting Christians who are saying that he also rose again. This is the first reference we have to the resurrection of Jesus coming from a non-biblical source. So I ask you Muslims, you need to be careful when you say Christ didn't die on the cross. You've got a moral confusion there. Tell me, what kind of God 
would put someone else on the cross and not tell anybody for 600 years. You've got a theological uh, contradiction because it contradicts Surah 6, Ayah 164, Surah 53, Ayah 38. You've got a confusion within Scripture itself. Surah 19, Ayah 33 co confronts Surah 4, 157. There doesn't seem to be, there doesn't seem to be a, a parallel between these two verses. But then you've got to go back and look at the historical evidence. Look at the biblical account. Look at the eyewitness account of those who were there. John, who was at the foot of the cross. Jesus turns to John and says, you take care about my mother. Mary, the mother of Jesus, who knew him intimately, who knew that was Jesus on the cross. And then you even look, got to look at the extra-biblical historical evidence, like Thallus, Tacitus, Phlegon, Josephus, Suetonius. They all talk about the crucifixion. They had nothing to gain to talk about it. And then you've got to make a decision. Did Jesus really or did he not die on the cross? Well, there's only one answer. It's right here. Four different accounts of that. Three of the eyewitnesses, one who found later, and you have to come to a decision. And you have to, therefore, once you come to that decision, realize what Christ has done for you. He did come. He did die. It was he that was on the cross. There's no other place I'm going to go to but the Bible to find that. And it's because God died on the cross for me. I know where I'm going. I know where I've come from. I know who I am. And I know who I'm going to meet when I see on the other side of death. Because only until he dies on the cross is the efficacy of what has happened for my sin. Been done. It's been done. It's happened 2,000 years ago. You need to accept it. Be careful where you go for your sources. Come back to the real source. The only source that talks about it. That is about Jesus Christ. He did die on the cross for you.